Hey everyone, my name is Maria. I work at Kampnagel's communications and marketing department. And today I decided to get in touch with some of the artists involved in the development of the dance rap opera, The Nose, that was, to have, uh, that was supposed to have a premiere at Kampnagel on March 18th. And currently I have four people with me online who are based in Hamburg and Johannesburg. And I, it would be really nice if you could guys introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Jessica Newpin and I am the artistic director of the production. My name is Lukas Schwengebecher. I'm uh, the, a viola player and yeah, a band member, instrumentalist of the, the Nose project. Hello. I'm Oscar Butelezi um, from Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm the choreographer, teacher, and a dancer. I'm Maria Isabel Hagen. I'm the dramaturg of this production. And now we are all here together online. But before that, we were all here in Hamburg, actually. And uh, you were working on the piece together, you were rehearsing, preparing for the premiere, but now we are all sitting in our homes. And what are you doing there actually these days? What are you working on? What is around you? Um, with me, I was kind of digesting um, the incidents that we had when we were at the Kampenagen. Um, but um, since from yesterday, I've started to um, engage with my um, fans and the society around me since I can't go to spaces and be creative and share um, the issues that are currently in our country with them. So I've started like um, creating um, small dance clips on um, how to sanitize and also on how to stay at home and really take care of ourselves to save lives out there so i've been like doing small videos and posting them on my social network but either than that is just um revisiting um the no story and just um familiarizing myself with it because this is not the end of it um it's still um a drill that we're gonna go through um, together with Jessica and the team. And do you post your stories now or your videos on your Instagram account so our followers yes. could also see it? Yes. Okay, cool. It's okay. Oscar Butelez, my handles. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I try to keep myself active and busy, for example, with my students. I'm in contact with my violin and viola students via Skype or Zoom uh, as well. And yeah, that works pretty well actually. And I put a lot of effort in that to also fill my time with a useful kind of work. And besides that, there's also a lot of organizational things going in the background, having phone calls with friends and colleagues discussing future projects, ideas. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, out uh, in the market, so to say. And yeah, but apparently there's also more free time. I watched uh, old movies from the 90s that I liked and <laughs> these kind of things. Um, yeah, you can also do now. But I think it's very important to go outside once a day alone or just with your partners or flat members to have some sun, some fresh air, and uh, yeah, to don't get extremely stuck in your flat or house. <laughs> Lucky you, you are able to go outside. I'm on day five ah. of 21 days lockdown. Mm, shit, yeah. In Germany, rules are not so extremely strict. Other countries yeah. have much stricter rules, also in Europe. And if you are not under quarantine, yeah. yeah, then you are still allowed basically to go out and keep the social distance. Yeah. Cool. How about you, Maria? I'm, I'm using this time um, to write new concepts, actually. Um, uh, I'm pretty busy, I have to say. I don't know how this came, but... Uh, no, I'm, I'm working on new projects. Um, I'm having a lot of Skype and Zoom discussions every day with my colleagues. 
um, which is my my general home office life anyhow. So I'm I'm not even I don't feel distracted or disturbed by this uh, by being at home because this is usually the way I work when I'm not rehearsing. Um, yeah, the only thing that I'm really desperately missing is um, that I can't go to the cafe and have a little break. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I think I have to get up and get my charger. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> and you, Jessica? Um, well, you know, the production ended, so to speak, um, in such an abrupt manner. You know, we had been working on this for two years, basically, and building up to a very big crescendo. Um, and an expectation of a delivery with only a few days to go. So kind of the energy, the expectation, the trajectory was at this point so high. So to have such a massive and, and, and immediate cut kind of broke, it really broke an, an, an energy and it broke uh, an expectation that was, you know, almost near to that sort of, zero to a hundred, it was near that sort of 100 point and we were pushing and working so hard. So for there to be, you know, such an abrupt ending was very emotional and, and um, kind of a very energy sapping um, incident. And so um, I would have loved to, you know, just have some time to, di to digest what happened, but you know, this is a very big team. Um, there are a lot of people involved as well as a lot of people who have supported the production as well. And so as, as management and, and sort of the director and the, the kind of the, you know, the, the, the head behind all of this, it was literally from Saturday the 14th going straight into fighting administrative fires, which we expected, uh, of course, but were not prepared for in such an abrupt way. So my team, my administrative team and I have literally also not had any free time. We've kind of been working day in and day out on, on how we are going to be able to mitigate two sides, how the production goes ahead in a time of great uncertainty and in a time of, of everybody looking for answers and no one having any. Um, and on the other hand, looking at what had just happened and how we are going to manage the situation that had just happened to us. And it was literally a case of something, you know, completely beyond anyone's control, but having to deal with that in such an abrupt way. So actually, um, apart from, you know, bringing out an old cookbook and, and, and you know, cooking up some recipes at night, to kind of, you know, find a, a sort of another focus for at least at the end of the day. My days have been completely filled with paperwork and, and communications and just trying to um, come to terms with the situation and, and find what would our possible way forward be. We've been speaking to um, the, the sort of management of Kampnagel with Amelie Deufelhard. I've been on the phone basically every morning. Um, we've been speaking to our funders the Kulturstiftung des Bundes, which is, you know, our main funder, and of course, to all, all, all different actors in, in, in the production. So it's been, a, it's been a massive, massive challenge. Yeah, I can imagine just it has been a really, really busy time for you with all this. Yeah. <laughs> thing. Although I have managed to find some time to do some yoga, it, actually, like right behind me. Uh, I don't have a balcony, so I can't kind of you know, get the sun there. So I've uh, kind of rolled up my mat and, and done some yoga and some meditation and kind of uh, have, have enjoyed a bit of, a bit of that quiet time for, for a bit of reflection. Speaking for the musicians, uh, I can say uh, we highly appreciate and have big respect, especially for Jessica and Maria and all these guys in the also administration, administrative team, because like compared to, for example, my, my way of working, I'm a freelance musician, I'm involved in many projects and just like three weeks before when this Corona thing just started slightly, um, I was like, okay, this concert might um, be canceled, this orchestra concert, this opera performance. But always when we were thinking of the notes that these performances in Kampnagel could really be canceled 
was actually beyond um, any uh, any imagination. So and this kind of process during the last three weeks, yeah, that came like a tsunami, because yeah, talking for myself, a month ago I could not at all imagine any reason why such a huge project could not happen finally. And now, now actually we feel really used to it unfortunately already now it feels like yeah totally normal situation yeah, and, yeah what jessica actually also said and, yeah, i think we what's, have, yeah. what's interesting is that you know this production of course there's like there's management here but actually at the end of us at the end of it all of us are artists so at the end of it i think we all feel uh, uh, of course you know as freelance artists you have to be unbelievably organized so already looking at you know what kind of uh, you know help the state would give us in germany what oscar would then perhaps also look at in south africa you know as a freelancer you really you know you have to look after your future you can't kind of just leave things to chance so it's kind of put all freelance artists in a in you know in a, in a very tough situation um and you know there's this there's this sense of not only kind of the emotional, um, the emotional effect of something happening so abruptly, and I think a tsunami is the best way to describe it. It really felt like a tsunami coming, but at the same time, there's there's a lot of uncertainty as to you know for a freelancer who relies uh, you know on projects um, of this nature and other natures, you know what, how, how are you literally going to survive now? Oscar, how's it, how's it, what's the situation like in South Africa regarding what the Minister of Arts and Culture, Nati Ntetwa, said? I mean, is, are there any um, ideas of relief packages for artists in South Africa? Um, nothing at all yet, but it's, um, the, the, the virus is just spreading so much and it's very hectic. Um, but with the artists, it's, we've got like groups, like theatres, uh, groups that we have on social media on how we can fight this um, uh, virus. But there's nothing else we can do because our job is to go out there in the community and go out there to the people. And the only thing that we can do now is just to do classes and make sure that other people are live streaming and to also watch um, the, the, the classes on how to keep fit and, and, and eat healthy. But um, another privilege that I had um, after posting this video from today, um, the UJ University of Johannesburg um, came on board to say, we like what you just started. So we'll be sending you music of our choir um, and then you can create um, dance pieces on that and then send it to us and then we can promote our music using your dance moves. Then after this lockdown, after 21 days, we'll call you to come and choreograph something and then you can make audition and find dancers, but use our um, choir music to create like um, a big production um, for it for 2021, which is was, um, for me, it was just a challenge to tell all dancers that let just not sit at home because we are locked in our houses. Um, let's try and do something and just um, keep um, our fans entertained and um, keep them on the loop that we're still with you. We're not just um, sitting at home and waiting for that um, time to, to, to go out of these 21 days. That's where we can start making um, money because um, if we're sitting at home, artists are not getting paid because we are, some of them, they are not permanently employed. Some of them are freelancers, as Jessica said. So for them, they have to pay bills. Um, tomorrow, it's the 1st of April and um, it's hectic for them. They don't know how they will get money to pay their bills because all their travelings have been cancelled with us as well. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's just an encouragement that we um, artists, we need to have and really engage. Like Maria said, she's busy engaging with other people and just to keep faith um, together and try new things because this thing, if it happens now, there might be a bigger thing that can happen. And we need to learn from this one and just stay strong and um, believe in our craft and really um, find new things to, to, to really um, keep our people um, together and stay safe at the same time. Maria, South Africa is on a 21 day lockdown. So you're not allowed to leave your, your house at all unless it's just for, for the most of, sort of necessary requirements. So 
it's it's definitely uh, stricter than here in Germany at the moment. Yeah, definitely. And how do people get the food and everything? Is it like the, so, uh, the social social, uh, social help that people receive from the state? Yeah, no, um, none. Uh, but um, you, if you want to get food, you need to go to the mall. And you can't travel with your family. You need to buy alone in the car. And then they escort you to the mall. You buy whatever you want to buy. And then they escort you out of the mall as well to make sure that you are doing that. And also if you want your um, um, medicine from um, um, pharmacies, they escort you as well. And if you are going to work, you need to show the proof of that you are employed there and your work is open for you to work in this lockdown but either than that if they find you on the streets they arrest you because it's like a national um lockdown you need to be inside the house you can't find yourself being walking on the street doing nothing so it's just quiet just waking up in the morning and just dancing in the living room then go back to bed for the next coming 21 days yeah yeah Okay, but back from the daily things to the artistic development of the nose. Jessica, I wanted to ask you, actually, how did you come up to the idea of bringing all the parts together that were, or all the parties, I would say, or artistic groups that were involved in the nose from different parts of the world? Maybe you can tell a bit more about this. Um, I could talk very long about this. I'm going to try to keep it brief. Basically, I mean, as a dancer and a choreography, dance uh, is, my, is my first medium. So, you know, having a look at um, kind of the, the global reach of, of opera, especially when looking at, you know, Africa as a continent and South Africa as a country, it was always seen as a very elitist, uh, elitist medium, an elitist part of theatre. Um, and yet I still, you know, there were parts of opera that I really, really enjoyed and, and that I found could potentially have a more contemporary message. And I'd always had this idea um, of, of, of being able to see if we can contemporaneize a, you know, a medium. And contemporary dance for me is, is the most kind of current form of, of, of communication for me as a choreographer um, in the arts and, and how choreographers contemporaneize their work um, and contemporaneize themes as well is, uh, has always been very, you know, has been fascinating for me. So I wanted to see if I could test this with, with musical theatre and opera. And um, this would not have been at all possible with some kind of playback or something. And I'd, you know, worked with Josh Sokol Dolgan before. And it, uh, you know, the ideas kind of married themselves very, very easily. Um, and kind of the third group of that was, you know, were these singers. Um, so, you know, having music and dance is something that comes very naturally to me, but being able to use, you know, a different medium to tell a story as well, um, or to kind of explain and, and, and further the narrative, um, it was kind of, again, just a very easy decision to, to, to bring singers into this. I'd never really worked with, you know, a, a group of six singers who would be able to, ha would have to hold the narrative as much as dances and music from my previous experience, but um, it was a challenge that I really wanted to take. Um, and so it was a very long process in terms of deciding. We also had very many limitations. Of course, budget is, is your biggest limitation, but there were a lot of very pivotal decisions that, that needed to be made in terms of the makeup of, of this and how many singers and how many dancers and how many musicians. And we ended up coming up with a pretty sort of equal share of each because the, nar the narrative of this piece was going to be carried by all mediums, not just by singers uh, literally or by dancers figuratively or by musicians, uh, you know, musically and, 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 you know, in a way of sort of musical color, but all parts needed to in some way carry the narrative. So, um, so the idea of it came quite, quite easily. The, uh, the actual practical, um, Sort of transporting of this idea and and putting it into practice has be, has been and was was kind of the biggest challenge. You know, you you can have these beautiful castles in the sky, but making them a reality is is where the real work comes in. And and working with with very good people and working with you know experts in their field is where you want to go with this, uh, especially when you're working with experimental theatre. And this definitely was was experimental, which was why it was also or is so exciting. 
And uh, Maria, Isabel, you were doing the, the uh, dramaturgy for the piece. How was it for you to work with such a big group of people on the stage? Well, as Jessica already said, I mean, uh, the bigger the group, the bigger the needs are, the bigger the, the different um, ideas or focuses on, on this work are. So uh, we were trying to figure out a way to work with um, so many experts in so many different fields. Um, and we even tried to, to make them mix and match, like have dancing singers and singing dancers, <laughs> for example. Um, so yeah, I think that was quite a challenge to, on the one hand, um, yeah, find a way to work with everyone in their individual needs um, to, to perform best. And at the same time, trying to brush out the best of this to make this a very beautiful art piece. Yeah, it, it basically, it feels like you're pushing stones like one after the other and you run from one side and then you push a little piece here, then you run to the other side and push a little piece here again to finally get the whole thing moving. Yeah, so when, when we were discussion, discussing after the rehearsals, for example, about music parts or if the, if the story works musically, then the next day we were focusing on uh, if the dance matches to this. And yeah, so it's just mm, trying, to, trying to keep an overview from very many different angles. But that was, I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I mean, I've never worked with such a big team before, but um, I enjoyed that a lot. I think what was quite interesting was, you know, getting to a certain point where the people that you were working with started to take the reins and started to pull the piece along because you've been pulling the piece along or pushing it for, for a very long time. And then there's kind of this, this moment of click, um, which you saw in different people throughout the process at different times. And when that click happened, and for some it hadn't happened yet, and there's no judgment there, but for some the click started to happen um, in whatever stage the piece was, and then those people were like, okay, it would be interesting if we tried to maybe take it a bit here, or tried a bit here. And I mean, I remember in some of the, you know, sort of music-oriented rehearsals, um, I mean, you know, there were some suggestions coming through, Lucas, you know, would suggest, you know, and what if we tried this? And what if we tried a bit of that? Because it showed that there was, it started to be a bit of an understanding of where we wanted to go. And in such a huge group, that's already quite an accomplishment to, to have, you know, certain actors and certain musicians and dancers at, 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 at a point saying, ha, huh, okay, I get where we're trying to go. What about this? And um, I mean, there was definitely a moment with all, everyone present in this meeting that, that had that moment. And that was, that's a point where you, when, you, when you've been pulling a production for a long time, uh, start to like go, okay, great. The, there's, there's, there's some sparks here. Lucas and Oscar, and how was it for you to be involved in the dance rap opera? I think it's quite um, unusual experience. At least it sounds for me so. And how is it, how did it feel for you and how was it different from the experiences you have had before in your artistic practice? Well, I would say uh, when, when you go into a classical opera project, mostly you know what to expect. If it's an, an old piece, Verdi, Wagner, whatever, or even a contemporary classic piece, you still kind of know what you have to expect. But um, yeah, a rap opera can be anything uh, if you just read it on the paper uh, on top of your sheet music. And for us musicians, instrumentalists, I think it was especially interesting to, uh, we started, uh, the, our first rehearsal week was uh, on Gut Siegen, this nice place in the countryside. Um, and we joined actually the pr creating process of this piece very late dancers, singers, everybody worked much longer on this and were much more into the piece and we didn't know anything yet. We came into something yeah, quite um, unprepared and, but that was also a chance to really discover the music actually from the musical point of view. Um, yeah, but then actually in Kampnagel during the final rehearsing process uh, the whole, let's say, door actually 
started to open for real because um, then everything connected and uh, before we were kind of in our own bubble a little bit and not really knowing where it's where it would uh, turn to and um, in Kampnagel everything kind of uh, joined and yeah it's, it's a very interesting combination of all these different aspects art I did something similar before not these huge projects but even in Kampnagel I did some for example, Don Giovanni opera production, what was also a little bit, little bit hip hop style, I think three years ago or something. So um, I got a taste of these kind of projects already before. Cool. And you, Oscar? Yes, um, with me, I would say it was kind of a challenging um, um, a moment to work um, with everyone because it's always difficult to work with people that you've never worked with before. Um, it's the first time you meet them. They work differently the way you work. And it's, it's a matter of we are human beings. We need to um, try and engage ourselves as humans before we can even create um, work together. We need to understand each other. But um, from my background, um, it was kind of a smooth way, if I can say, um, because I'm, I've, I've choreographed big um, productions before, such as um, The Color Purple, The Lady Smith, Black Mambazo, and The Global Citizens. But the, uh, the main um, point that I'm saying, why I'm saying it was kind of smooth for me, it was the dancers that I was working with, I've, I'm working with them full time. So I know how they move, I know how they, um, they are weaknesses and their strengths. And also I've worked with Jessica before. So my job was to actually listen to my director. Uh, my director says, Oscar, I need this to happen. My job was to make sure that the choreography to those dancers that I'm used to, it, it's delivered. And um, um, musically, um, it, it was something new because I've never worked on the production of opera and um, that, that kind of uh, singing. But um, it was kind of a lovely and um, uh, journey. Um, but in terms of choreographing for my side, it was interesting. I loved the story. And um, the only difficulties I had was to actually give the dancers what the director needed in terms of um, embodying the movement and the story and um, living the story rather than telling the story to the audience but becoming those characters that are in the story, um, which is, we, there are uh, more similarities, um, those characters and us living right now. Um, so it was more of like excavating in um, uh, some things from the dancers and also from the actors, making the actors um, move on stage. It's um, something that they've never done before, but seeing their hunger and, um, like wanting to dance on stage like us. It was a breathtaking moment to say, you know what, let's, let's, we're in this together. Any mistake that happens, we are in this together. So it was kind of a um, hard and smooth most of the time for me because I was just getting um, orders from my director telling me what to do. And the dancers that I'm, I, we were working with were uh, uh, people that I'm used to working with. And back to the concept of the whole story and about this just uh, this um, fantastic story that was written by Gogol about the North that was running away from the owner's face. And then actually there are many social, I would say social connections or connections to the society that one can make uh, through this story. and. This question is to all of you. How do you think the whole story is related to the situation in society today and where we can see some connection? I, for me, I would say this is the time for us um, to really relate with the story. Um, artists taking ownership um, to everything that is supposed to, that to, to everything that we supposed to to handle 
um, um, now we don't have jobs, we want money, but it's our um, um, responsibility to take ownership and take space to say, because we are sitting at home, we can't just sit and relax and wait for the 21 day lockdown to finish before we can be able to do the no's. But how can we find more things and resources around the house to make sure that we engage with the society and say, as artists, we still have this language. This is our language and we are still here. No matter what happens in the society outside, but even whether we are locked in our houses, but we still take um, our, our groundness to say, we want to take ownership. And also um, most of the time, I was always looking at the story on the other side um, of the view to be South African and black to actually do this kind of a Russian story. Um, what similarities that we have that are kind of common. So there's a lot, there are a lot of things that are common. Um, losing your nose with me would be witchcraft. You know, our, our beliefs are different as um, blacks and um, whites. And it was more of me getting to marry the two um, stories together and also following my um, culture on how do I practice my, my rituals. And it was kind of interesting, I might say. Are there any other ideas about it? Well, I just had this idea just in the beginning of our conversation or probably even before we got kind of recorded, I, <laughs> I picked up this um, sticker, I am myself, what, uh, from our production, what is kind of a motto or more or less, um, and also the story, as far as I understood the message, it's a lot about this um, strong, independent um, personality, also female um, personality, and yeah, compared to our situation now as artists, when I think of myself uh, during the first days of all this uh, crisis starting and concert halls got closed and immediately, yeah, a slight panic starts growing inside you, telling, oh my God, I, I'm, not, I'm not useful anymore. My jobs are canceled. What should I do? And you even click on a, on a news um, site where it says actually the farmers are looking for um, people to pick up the, the vegetables from the fields these days. <laughs> and you think of, oh, I could do it once, uh, once a week. But then actually you realize nothing against this kind of job, but still you realize, okay, no, but I am an artist. I'm a musician. I'm maybe now not so extremely necessary in this moment compared to people working in the hospital and that's okay and i think we shouldn't we also shouldn't make us kind of artificially more important as we are but still we should value that we are in general very important and people will will actually be extremely happy when the cultural life will start again whenever hopefully sooner than later but yeah to realize uh, also our profession, how important it is, maybe not now and not tomorrow, but in general and in, in half a year for sure again. I had to think of the story of the nose quite often in the recent days because I very much resemble to the nightmarish situation at the moment. I mean, not when I'm sitting at home, um, not when I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking of this nightmarish atmosphere when I'm just doing my things at home or when I talk on the phone to friends. But I, I just went for a walk before this, um, before this Zoom meeting and saw the people lining up in front of a post office going nearly around one of the, <laughs> one of the other buildings, uh, keeping the distance of two meters. And what I think is so, so absurd yeah is that you uh, take over a situation like this so easily and out of a sudden it's normal to line up in front of a post office uh, with two meter distance out of a sudden it's um, 
you you try you you find a way to deal with the fact that there is no toilet paper in the shops. Thank God there is, <laughs> but there was a lot. <laughs> so um, I think yeah, the the also uh, those those small details that people are craving toilet paper. You would have never thought of this three weeks, four weeks ago that that people would would carry home toilet papers <laughs> to store it. Uh, so I think the yeah the the nightmarish aspect um, I, I I'm yeah I'm I'm seeing this quite often during the day in very small details that differ a lot to the life I was living, let's say in February. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, the nightmarish paranoia um, ideas here are just so prevalent to today. I mean, they've been prevalent for, for, you know, at least the last five years, very much so. But they've kind of come to a very pivotal point right now where, where you look at this piece, you look at the environment in which Google set it, and you look at our current landscape, our current political and socio landscape, and, and you think to yourself, gosh, you know, did he write it in 1836 or did, you know, that is sort of alias right at now. And so, you know, there was a lot of the story that, you know, really reflected, you know, our current circumstance, but, you know, even two years ago. But for me, you know, there, this idea of bureaucracy and, and corruption as well and accepting the new normal so easily. But, you know, of course, there was an Afrocentric being a South African and a Eurocentric living in Europe for half of my life. And there were these two kind of conflicting and sort of interlacing narratives that were constantly playing on me as I read the story. So seeing it kind of from two perspectives and, you know, wondering if you bring, you know, these two nationalities um, into, into a space, um, first working with them separately and then bringing them to the space, you know, what is that collision of narrative? What, you know, what does that say? And, and when you make the nose, which is, you know, the most central point of, of the physical identity of the face, something where there's so many analogies, you know, of, the, of direction, of something that's pivotal to the face, that's pivotal to your identity, um, that's, that, you know, if you lose it, you lose your direction, this idea of ownership and loss, and, and what if that is represented, represented by a black woman? You know, the, the idea of feminism in the patriarchy, the idea of expecting the unexpected in, a, in, in almost a Truman Show-like environment. There, there were just, you know, I mean, there are a lot of themes that, that Google writes about, but this idea of really finding that mirrored um, perception of that in, in today, um, and this idea of, you know, taking ownership, being the nose, are you more, do you identify yourself more with this nose that says, hell no, I'm going on my own path here, I'm looking for the truth, or do you identify with someone who has uh, suffered a huge sense of loss, and, and in a way, becomes a bit of a victim to circumstance. So there are these two parallel narratives that, that intertwine with each other, but also, you know, kind of suffer and, and achieve their own fates. Um, and I think that these kind of, this, it's almost um, like being a bit schizophrenic throughout. And I think if you look at, you know, where, how we're living now, it, it feels rather schizophrenic. Um, and so that's for me where this contemporary nature, where this sort of very relative, um, feeling as well as you know these thoughts and ideas really really became very clear um, as we started you know as we continue to 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 produce this work yeah I also have a feeling that there are many connections that one can make to the situation uh, today or to the daily situations that we go through today or had before but now I think many of those situations they become even more visible and bizarre. I mean, the bizarre becomes acceptable. And uh, for me, I see that every day, things that I, you know, look at and say, this is absolutely bizarre. I find myself doing them two days later. You know, it's, it's I mean, I, I, I defiantly did not buy toilet paper through the entire time, defiantly. And, and then when I really needed it, <laughs> I was like, should I take three packs? You know, you know, you kind of, it plays on you, you know, and, and, and is it a choice? You know, are you, are you choosing to be defiant, stick to your guns, or you're like, well, actually, I might as well go with the stream. 
because everybody else is. You know, it's, it's a negotiate. It's a constant negotiation, and that's what the piece was constantly throughout these themes. Who are you negotiating with? Who, which who do you identify with more? Yeah. Okay, I'm very thankful for the discussion today and I'm very thankful that you joined me today in this interview. I wish you to stay healthy. I wish you to be online with us and I really hope to see the peace at Kampnagel. You will. Thank you. Don't quite know yet when, but you will. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Maria. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Yes, see you soon. Bye-bye.